It is warm. All right, our, we got the thumbs up. Our third speaker for the session is Paul Morin from the Polar, Polar Geospatial Center from the University of Minnesota. He'll be talking about his Arctic digital elevation mapping project on Blue Waters. Thanks, Paul. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out who put these talks together because we went from solid earth, we went crustal, and now we're going to go surficial now. I'm expecting some atmospheric talks after this. Um, this is this is a different project in the sense that we're not doing simulation. We're doing um, data processing. We're, we're taking an enormous amount of high resolution remote sensing and turning it into elevation. Um, to put this in perspective, um, this was a project that was defined by the previous presidential administration um, to occur during the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Now, the U.S. chairmanship is just ending, and we're getting to the point of, of delivery here. Um, this project is enormous. We're talking about taking, you know, probably near a petabyte of data and compressing it down into high-resolution, time-dependent, two-meter posting elevation models that have been assembled then into a mosaic at a five meter posting. Um, to put that in perspective, the resolution that we're producing here is about the size, about the length of the height of a, a tall man. And so if you divide up the entire Arctic with two meter cells, we're producing that much data about four times over. And so also to put this in perspective, the lower 48 are about 10 million square kilometers, the way we define the Arctic, which is um, the Earth from at the pole down to about 60 degrees north, Kamchatka, the Aleutians, and, and Greenland. This is a pretty big place. So what we're doing is we're taking imagery that's been licensed by the uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and we're, we're that imagery was collected in a very, very specific way. So these are telescopes orbiting the Earth. They scan the surface of the Earth. They wait another 45 seconds, they scan it again. So it's the equivalent of having parallax from about 350 kilometers in orbit. We're using three different satellites here. This is a, a, a constellation of satellites that's owned by a company called Digital Globe in Colorado. Uh, but we're using Worldview 1, 2, and 3, and these really are kind of extraordinary satellites. They're versions basically of Hubble, and, but they're pointed the other way, um, and they have a resolution of between about 32 to 42 centimeters. So you can see objects on the ground that are about a foot uh, in size. Why blue waters? It really was the only resource that could be stood up this quickly. They were able to take our existing code. We were able to work together to get this working in an extremely short period of time. They have staff that basically moved heaven and earth to make this start. And the key challenges here, um, and half of these are computational and the other half are kind of uh, <clears throat> remote sensing and <clears throat> um, uh, computer science and, uh, and image processing, computer science, and uh, a few HPC, we have a lot of jobs. Um, if, you, if you take all of this petabyte of data that we have together, it comprises about 1.6 million images. So when you put that together, you have about 800,000 jobs that you have to process. Uh, the scheduler itself had to change. We had to be able to submit jobs that could fit in every corner of Blue Waters. Um, we also had to bundle those jobs in a way that the, the, the schedule could, could digest. <clears throat> a few of the other things I'll talk about is we had to make some choices about things like mosaicing and filtering clouds. Um, in the past, people haven't worked at this scale before, and there was never really a possibility of being able to do this by hand. And of course, um, one of the key things here that, that Claire did, who's here, is we had to build the factory. We were doing this on a piecemeal basis, but we had to be able to shovel an entire region in, something, say, half the size of Alaska at a time. And so some of the accomplishments we've had are 
we're on, on target right now to produce about 80,000 individual time-dependent DEMs representing uh, about five years of remote sensing. So this is the equivalent of doing the lower 48 about eight times over, or about once every three months. And one of the most amazing things that we've done here is we've, we're, we're, we seem to be achieving right now a spherical accuracy, so just an accuracy of that point on the ground of about one meter. And this pipeline is nearly automated at this time. And the one, one really important thing here is it's geography independent, so we can run it at the Arctic, we can run it elsewhere on Earth. And one of the, the interesting aspects of this that we really didn't even occur, didn't occur to us in the beginning because we, were, we just wanted the data set, but it drove the cost of this kind of meter scale DEM from tens of dollars, so 10 to $50, to between one and four cents per, per square kilometer. Specifically, the, the contributions of the Blue Water team is, is the, the, the scheduling and bundling. The, 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 the SWIFT team was, was absolutely critical to be able to bundle jobs together in a size that this machine could digest without making the, the scheduler come to its knees. Also, we all come from a computational background, but I hadn't touched supercomputing in, in over a decade. It took extensive education just to get us up to speed, and also just frank discussions about what's possible and what's not. You know, I'm going to get to content here in a second, but as far as broader impact, if you look at the ground, if you deal with the ground at all, anything from hiking to, to putting a, a, a nuclear reactor somewhere, this data is important. If you care about earthquakes or water going downhill, or forestry, or civil engineering, or natural resources management. This is the data set of, of the day. As far as sharing the data, um, we've, we've distributed ab about 300,000 DEMs in the past seven months. That's about 150 terabytes. And it's also becoming the national terrain standard of the, the countries of Canada and Iceland. It's largely described as absolutely essential by the polar community. So this is a map of what we've, what we've distributed and, and what we're about to distribute um, um, uh, in, in the next month or so. So far, we've, we've, we've uh, released Alaska, Kamchatka, North and, um, and Western Greenland, and all, uh, along with Baffin Island and a few of the islands in the uh, Russian archipelago. The next one that comes out in how many weeks, Claire? Two weeks, okay. That's confidence. Um, is absolutely huge. It's the rest of Canada. It's 50% of Greenland and probably about 40% of Siberia. Okay. This is big. This is huge. And this really can, can only be done on, on blue waters right now. And so just to give you a sense of what this data coming out in this next time is going to look like, here are some islands in the Canadian archipelago with, with um, uh, ice caps on the end. We have some, some beautiful structural geology just in random places in Canada. Here's the Northwest Passage. This is uh, the area you can either take a ship right through here or you can go up above. So that's where the Franklin Expedition died. There are some wonderful structural geology all along the, the, uh, um, the western, western Arctic Canada and in, in, in the high Rockies there. You, you see these wonderful river systems all over the place that are cutting right through the mountains. Canada. I mean, we're delivering half a country here. This, this really was stunning to us. This, this wasn't really possible in any other way. In, in the past, people have flown airborne missions, and you get better data, but you can only do something on the order of hundreds or maybe a, a, a thousand square kilometers a day. You know, on blue waters, we're doing, we're doing many, much, much more than that. And, as you know, we're working our way basically from the top down, from, from, 
from the places no one's seen to places where people have seen. And we're starting to run into straight lines. And for people like us that work in the natural sciences, in the high Arctic and the Antarctic, we don't straight, see straight lines a lot. And we started to see places like this, where this is the, the Russian oil company's natural gas fields um, in Siberia. You can see basically all the pipelines and the, the pump rigs and the infrastructure all over the place. Here's the Mir diamond mine in Siberia, one of the largest diamond mines in the world. Here's, this is fields near Petropavlovsk in, in Kamchatka. You can actually see uh, on some of these the, the, the furrows from, from plowing. It's, it's so good. Oops, what have I done? Oh, there we go. And then we've run into some really interesting um, capabilities that we never thought we would have. Um, we, we were looking at DEMs and imagery of, of Arctic Sweden recently, and this is a, uh, a national park in the far north of Sweden, up near uh, where Norway comes over top. And um, we were seeing something unusual, so we went back to the original imagery. So this is 30 centimeter imagery, and we really didn't see much, but if you go to the DEM, you start seeing these straight lines all over the place. And it took us a while to realize that they were, these were sm snowmobile tracks. And so we're seeing snowmobile tracks as people go from actually this place. It's really handy having Google Earth now because you can go in and get all these geotagged photos. So they were leaving from this cluster of, of cabins along the lake and then going out in this direction. Let me go back. And so the cabins are right here. If we were clever enough, we could probably go in and tell exactly how deep these, these, these uh, tracks were. And if you knew something about the snow conditions, you probably could figure out the weight of the snowmobile. Why this matters? This is earth science. We only really get to look at the present. We don't necessarily know how it got to be this way. And so in earth sciences, the, the phrase we always come back to, this is what you get in introductory geology is the present is, in, is the key to the past. And one of the most key ways of seeing the present is through the topography. And this is one of the most important foundational data sets in our science. And so here's one of my other favorites. This is in, the, um, in far eastern Russia, way up, it's about 70 degrees north. It's a bunch of what are called thermokarst lakes. So these are lakes that are in permafrost. And so permafrost basically is something like piecrete. So it's, it's, it's something like peat that's frozen. And so the lakes are in there. And as the Arctic melts, these lakes start to drain. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna zoom into this little area in the corner right here. And we're going to talk you through this unnamed lake right here. So for the people over here at this lake, you notice that many of these lakes are just flat. So this is taken in the winter. So we're seeing frozen lakes with snow on top. They're nice and flat, but you see these rings here. What happens is these lakes are sitting in an ice cube with say, you know, it's very similar to like having having uh, grass clippings in it. It's held together. And in the summer, that, that area warms up, the lakes become liquid. But if it warms up too much, the, the, the edges of the lake that are permafrost melt. And when the permafrost lakes melt, you get a little stream from one lake to the next one that's down slope. And it goes from lake to lake to lake to lake and lake to lake to lake to lake to lake to lake. So what you're seeing here in the topography is the Arctic melting. And each one of these things, you can actually see it happen in stages here where you see these rings. So the, the, this, this dam of ice melts. The lake goes down a few, a few uh, centimeters. It happens again and it happens again and it happens again. And we're seeing that through the topography. Here's another one of my favorites in a remote random place in, in Siberia. Here are two images from 2012 and 2015. 
we made DEMs for these two, we aligned the two, and then we subtracted them. And what you end up with is basically a difference map showing um, the basically clear cuts in this case. And they're so good here that not only do you see that you have clear cuts, but you can see that they have cut access roads to get in there. So we're seeing individual trees being cut down. And it's good enough right now that you can see on one side of the clear cut, 12 meter trees were cut. And on the other side, it was 20 meter trees. We know how much carbon was removed. Here's another one. This is Southeast Alaska. Uh, it, the darker colors are higher elevation. What you're looking at are stands of trees next to the ocean here. We can go in and draw a profile across here. And what you see in the profile is that these trees were cut at different times and then replanted and they started to grow back. So it's a fairly flat place. And so you can go in on a tree by tree and cut by cut scale across 30 degrees of latitude on the globe and you can see every tree and where, where that is right now. And so here's some of the, to, one of the considerations we have with processing. This, isn't, this is the kind of problems we worry about. We're not necessarily worried about throughput right now, we're worried about trees. And so we have this, this situation where we have some, some fluffy something over here and then we have some, uh, a lake over here or over here, and then you have some, some, basically it looks like some kind of grassland. And through our processing, it takes out all that fluffy stuff. We're thinking that that's cloud. And what, what we discovered going back to the original imagery was that it started to look furry. These were trees. And so we're down at a resolution right now that we're worried about whether there's leaf on or leaf off for individual trees across an entire hemisphere in this case. And we're trying to deal with, with that level of, of detail. To put this in perspective, we're producing two meter posting elevation. In the western US, as, as anybody who does any hiking or earth science knows, the elevation data is pretty awful. And in fact, anywhere that's yellow here it's 10 meter elevation data that could be three or four decades old. Anywhere that's yellow is now at lower resolution than the elevation that we have for most of Siberia, for Greenland, for Kamchatka, for, for Alaska now. And just to put it in kind of a blue waters perspective, every once in a while we'll get quite a bit of capacity on blue waters. So if you see the pie chart on the blue waters go above half, for more than a day, if we can get that for about a, maybe two days or three days, it's the equivalent of producing two meter posting elevation for the entire lower 48. We've never seen capacity like this before. And we figured, you know, as long as you're doing one side of the planet, you might as well do the other side. And so not only do we have better data in the Arctic than we do for the Western United States, but um, we're, we've got Antarctica underway. And so one way of thinking of what this team has, has achieved and what the Blue Waters product, project has achieved is we have topography of 99% of the ice on Earth. Where are we going? Both poles will be released within a year at resolution better than the contiguous lower 48. We're looking at more resolution. Right now we're producing two meter in the Arctic and eight meter in the Antarctic, but we can take that to 50 centimeter with the existing imagery with more computer time. We're looking at a change in imagery access in about 2020. And we're, we're looking at other satellites here. Remember, we're, we're, we're working with commercial satellites right now that are under contract, and those contracts come and go. We're looking at the possibility of possibly doing the entire Earth once or twice a month at four meters. It's every landslide, that's every plate boundary, that's every piece of ice, that's every, um, every tree. 
And so this is, this is what we're looking at now. So we're using these satellites, that, that big one up in the, uh, the, the, on the left here, that's Worldview 3. The next thing is this little thing here. That's, that's called a dove. It's by planet. They, they launch them in batches of 90 at a time. They're four meter resolution. You can hold one in your hand. There are ways of configuring those to get us the data properly so you could look at almost everywhere continuously in a topographic way. Thank you. <laughs>